Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 127, Kermit Zarley's Solving the Samaritan Riddle. Mr. Kermit Zarley was a successful professional golfer on the PGA Tour and the Champions Tour, but now he's a noted Christian author and blogger. His published books include The Gospels Interwoven, Palestine is Coming, The Third Day Bible Code, Warrior from Heaven, and The Restitution of Jesus Christ. But he's here today to talk with us about his fascinating new book called Solving the Samaritan Riddle, Peter's Kingdom Keys Explain Early Spirit Baptism. Theologian, author, and blogger Dr. Scott McKnight describes this as, quote, a bold and adventurous book, and he adds that it is a wonder that someone has not suggested this theory before. Mr. Zarley, welcome back to the Trinity's podcast. Hey, Dale. I'm very happy to be back here with you. Mr. Zarley, this book concerns clashing Christian views about the baptism or filling with the Holy Spirit and also the interpretation of the book of Acts. But the starting point for your book is this famous passage in Matthew chapter 16. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Mr. Zarley, Christians have long disagreed about what to make of these metaphorical keys that Jesus gives to Peter. What are the main interpretations out there? There has not been a, a consensus among biblical scholars about how to understand Peter's keys that Jesus promised to give him. But some scholars concerning the book of Acts have said that there is a connection with Jesus' statement that he will baptize with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. He said to his disciples shortly before his ascension to heaven. And when you read the book of Acts, you find that there is this baptism with the Holy Spirit that goes on, starting in Acts 2, where the disciples are baptized with the Holy Spirit, and then they speak in tongues, and then Peter preaches the gospel. And then you, you go throughout the book of Acts, and you see that there are four episodes of baptism of the Holy Spirit. And some scholars have believed that there's a connection between those episodes and Jesus' previous promise to give Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, this passage is familiar to a lot of Christians because of the Roman Catholic take on it. How do they see this promise, this giving keys to Peter? Starting in the third century, the fathers started to say that this baptism with the Holy Spirit is something that happens after conversion. And in the Catholic Church, conversion is water baptism, and that makes you a member of the Catholic Church. But you're not a full member mm -hmm. until you're confirmed in the church. And so in the history of the Catholic Church, they eventually created this catechism, which is the teaching of Catholicism, that they made a requirement of those who were baptized into the church had to go through catechism and then they could do confirmation. So those are the first two of the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. So water baptism is first, and then confirmation is second, and after they've done catechism. All of these are rituals that are performed by church leaders. And in confirmation, a bishop typically says a statement 
and then touches the candidate's forehead with oil and says, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so that's when the Catholic Church believes that a person is baptized with the Holy Spirit at the performance of this ritual called confirmation. That's the Roman Catholic view. And so they think that Peter was given a special authority which was invested in the bishops and specifically in the Roman bishop to be the dispensers of grace in a sense. And so the bishop, or in later days, I guess a priest can do this? Yes, of course. They believe that Peter being given the keys of the kingdom is passed down to successors, and those successors are the popes of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, in the case of confirmation, the bishops are given authority under the Pope to confirm those who have been baptized in the Catholic Church. All right, that seems to be reading quite a lot into, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> There's no mention of successors or whoever sits in Peter's seat or stuff like that. Yeah. So non-Catholics don't accept that interpretation. When the Reformation came around, what did the Reformers want to say Peter's keys amounted to, or the rock? Well, of course, the rock is a whole discussion in itself. You know, Jesus says, upon this rock, I'll build my church. Gates of hell will not prevail against it. What did Jesus mean by rock? The Catholic Church had always said that the rock is Peter himself. And since Peter was the first pope, of the Catholic Church, which, of course, they believe there was only one church, and it was the Catholic Church. Peter's that rock, and then his successors also inherit that. But the Protestant Church says, no, Peter is not that rock. The rock is the confession that Peter made previous to Jesus promising him the keys. And that confession was when Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And that confession is what the Protestant church says is the rock. But concerning the Catholic church's separation of conversion and the baptism of the Holy Spirit in confirmation, the Protestant church says, no, that's not biblically correct. People are baptized with the Holy Spirit when they are converted to Christ. And so that's called simultaneity. And that has been the, the general view of most non-Catholics. And the reason for that general view, in a word, is Paul. Yes, that's right. Paul teaches very clearly that at least during his time and thereafter, conversion and spirit baptism happen simultaneously. Therefore, Paul does not require some outward initial evidence, as the Pentecostal Church teaches, to prove that people have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I thought it was interesting, uh, the part of your book where you discussed the classical Protestant interpretation where they said, no, the rock isn't Peter, the rock must be the message. And you pointed out that a lot of scholars have come around to the view that, well, isn't that an overreaction against the Catholic view? Because, I mean, he names Peter rock, <laughs> Kephas in, uh, in Aramaic, and uh, Petros in Greek. I mean, isn't Peter the rock? And your thesis is actually consistent with that. That's it's Peter that's the rock, but it's not the rock in the sense of being the first pope. Yes, that is my view. And you're right. A lot of scholars, non-Catholics, have come to this position that they agree with the Catholic Church that the rock is Peter, but not in the sense that the church believes, which they believe that Peter is the pope. I was taught the Protestant view early in my Christian theological education, and I believed it ever since until just two years ago when I got into this subject and, of course, started researching and writing this book. And I changed to the view that some of, many of these scholars hold now, uh, many evangelical scholars, that the rock is Peter, not his confession. 
When the Trinity's podcast returns, what is the Samaritan riddle? Mr. Zarley, one significant theological divide in the Christian world has arisen just in the early 20th century. This is the view that all Christians are meant to receive a second blessing after conversion, often called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that the uniform evidence of this is the phenomenon of speaking in tongues. Pentecostals insist on this new teaching, and all other Christians disagree with them. How did this new teaching arise? Pentecostalism is a rather modern phenomena, and it is very important in the history of Christianity. 27% of all professing Christians in the world now are Pentecostal or charismatic. Pentecostalism arose out of the Wesleyan holiness movement in the 1800s that was started in North America. Previous to that, the pilgrims believed in a so-called second blessing, but for them, it was not baptism in the Holy Spirit evidenced by tongues. It was just to have an assurance that you truly are a saved person and belong to Christ. Mm -hmm. And this became popular in the Wesleyan holiness movement. Eventually, the successor of John Wesley, who was John Fletcher, he taught that this second blessing was the baptism with the Holy Spirit, but he did not teach that it had to be evidenced by speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. And so the Pentecostal movement began in the early 1900s, and that's what they taught, that the baptism with the Holy Spirit is something that happens subsequent to conversion, So they call it the doctrine of separation and subsequence. They use the word separation to emphasize that conversion and spirit baptism are separate. So they use the word separate and subsequence. And they mean that this is a second blessing. It happens after conversion. And they said that this must be evidenced by speaking in tongues. Now, Not all Pentecostals today believe that spirit baptism must be evidenced by speaking in tongues. That position is now referred to as classic Pentecostalism. Mm -hmm. Most Pentecostals still believe that. For example, the largest denomination, church denomination in Pentecostalism is the Assemblies of God. That's about 67 million people. And that's what that church teaches. They teach the doctrine of separation and subsequence. So they believe that when a person receives the Holy Spirit, which is after conversion, that it must be evidenced by speaking in tongues. And classical Pentecostals tend to focus on just the early portions of Acts. What are they so concerned about there? Uh, They cite Luke's writings It's like a sacred text within a sacred text for them. That is the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. They emphasize, of course, Acts 2, in which the uh, Holy Spirit first came upon the disciples and they spoke in tongues. And then Peter preached. And in Acts 2.38, Peter, of course, was preaching during the feast of Pentecost there in Jerusalem and thousands of Jews who attended the feast were hearing him. And he said, repent and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. Luke tells us that 3,000 Jews believed that day uh, after hearing Peter preach. But Luke does not tell us that they were then baptized with the Holy Spirit. So most people, including scholars, assume that they received the Holy Spirit right that day when they believed. But as to them speaking in tongues, Luke doesn't say anything about that either. The whole issue of other people speaking in tongues besides the 120 disciples on the day of Pentecost, 
first arises in Acts 8. Now, why is it that most theologians have not come around to support this view about separation and consequence? Yeah, it's because of Paul, especially two texts in which he makes it very clear that he believes that spirit baptism occurs simultaneously with conversion. Here in Romans 8, verse 9, he says to the Roman Christians, but you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. So that indicates right there that everyone who has been converted to faith in Jesus, they have the spirit of God. The spirit of God dwells in them. But then Paul says, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ, which for Paul is the same as the spirit of God, does not belong to him, meaning does not belong to Christ. So if a person does not have the spirit of God, they do not belong to God in Christ. That's what Paul clearly teaches right here. And he says basically the same thing over in 1 Corinthians. And there's another fact that you discuss in your book, Mr. Zarley, and I encountered this back in the early 90s when I was an undergraduate student at Biola University, the Evangelical University in Southern California. I took a class on the book of Acts, and it was taught by this fellow, a uh, good guy. He used to be a missionary, and he was friendly to Pentecostalism. I don't, I'm not sure if he was a cessationist or not, who thinks that uh, speaking in tongues and things like prophecy and healing have gone away. But he went very sympathetically through the book of Acts, but he pointed out that it's not clear that in every instance this pattern is followed, where first a group is saved, and then sometime later they get this second blessing. Yes, you find that when you go through the book of Acts and you look at the four episodes in which people were clearly baptized with the Holy Spirit. Uh, as I said, the first one is in Acts 2. The second one is in Acts 8. And that's where the title for my book arises, Solving the Samaritan Riddle. Jimmy Dunn, whose book, Baptism with the Holy Spirit, that was his first book, and incidentally, I think Jimmy Dunn is one of the two top New Testament scholars in the world, the other one being Tom Wright. Jimmy, when he got his PhD, he wrote his dissertation on baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that became his first book. That book I critique quite a bit in my book, Solving Samaritan Riddle. So Jimmy calls Acts 8, verses 14 through 17, the Samaritan riddle. Now, what is it about? Well, Philip, who was not one of the 12 apostles, he went down to Samaria and he preached the gospel and Luke says they believed. And so they did not receive the Holy Spirit. Luke says that the apostles who were in Jerusalem at the time they heard about this and they sent Peter and John to Samaria from Jerusalem and they laid hands on these Samaritan men and they received the Holy Spirit. Now it's interesting that Luke doesn't say they spoke in tongues, but it's obvious that something outward happened because this magician called Simon who was among them he became very enamored with this by seeing the evidence of the Holy Spirit in their life. And so you gather from this that something outward happened. Either they were magnifying God or the, the Samaritans were prophesying or something happened so that this was evidence that the Holy Spirit had come into their life and they were therefore baptized with the Holy Spirit. But the question is, why did this happen when Peter and John, days later, after these Samaritans were converted to faith in Jesus, why did the baptism with the Holy Spirit have to happen days later when Peter and John came there and laid hands on them? Now, a common view in the history of the church has been they initially, when it came to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, people had to have the apostles lay hands on them in order for them to receive the Holy Spirit. 
Well, when you turn to the third episode in the book of Acts, it's an entirely different scenario. Here's what happened. Peter went to the Gentiles in Caesarea. Actually, it was Cornelius's home. Cornelius was a centurion in the Roman military, a Gentile. And he had called all these people and relatives to his house because Peter was going to show up which he did, and Cornelius asked him to give them this message from God that Cornelius believed that Peter was going to deliver. And so Peter was preaching to them, and Luke tells us that while Peter was right in the midst of preaching the gospel to this Cornelius' household, they started speaking in tongues. And so that was proof that they had both believed the gospel message that Peter was preaching and the Holy Spirit had come upon them, which is the baptism with the Holy Spirit, so that it happened simultaneously. And so this is totally different from what happened in Acts 8 to the Samaritans. And that's another reason for this so-called Samaritan riddle. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Mr. Zarley's suggestion that Peter's keys are a key to understanding the book of Acts. Do you, like some critics of Pentecostalism, ascribe speaking in tongues to demonic influence, or do you think it's just a merely natural, excited babbling? I actually was taught that view early in my Christian theological education, that Pentecostals who spoke in tongues, it happened because either they were, it was psychosomatically induced and therefore not a real phenomenon. Mm -hmm. or it was from demonic influence. That I believed for a a short period of time, only about, mm, I think it was maybe four years I accepted it. But then I read myself out of that view, meaning that in my own personal reading of the Bible, I decided that, no, that's not correct. I would say that probably I was influenced a little bit because I knew some Pentecostals. Mm -hmm. And I knew from their life, from their devotion to Jesus, that, no, these people are Christians and they are living a Christian life. And, no, they're not mentally deranged. (laughs) And so I came to the viewpoint that this whole idea about certain spiritual gifts that Paul says the Holy Spirit gives to Christians, that some of them, such as healings, prophesying, miracles, and speaking in tongues, which I was taught those are called supernatural gifts. Mm -hmm. Some people call them miraculous gifts, and they do this to distinguish them from other spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives as Paul teaches on this subject in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, that there are a whole array of various spiritual gifts, some of which are teaching, wisdom, faith, etc. They distinguish between these, these two types of gifts. What I was taught was as a so-called supernatural or miraculous gifts, like speaking in tongues, had been done away with in the first century, either after all the apostles died off or after the completion of the Bible, meaning the New Testament, all of the New Testament books and letters had been written Mm -hmm. supposedly by the end of the first century. I read myself out of this view in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, right there in verses 8 through 10. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in in part shall be done away. I'm 
quoting here from memory, probably King James Version. That which is perfect is come. I was taught means the completed Bible, but I decided, no, that's taking it out of its context. The context is the second coming of Christ. Paul says when we're face to face with Christ, that's what Paul is talking about, the second coming. So that these so-called supernatural gifts, there'll be no need for them when Jesus returns with his kingdom and the new covenant is implemented into our lives. That to me seemed quite obvious from the context. So I no longer believed in the so-called cessation of certain spiritual gifts after that point, which was about 1966. I believe that in other words, that God through his spirit can give any of these gifts that Paul teaches about. Gift of tongues, whatever. This is just up to God. And so I believe there are people who have spoken in tongues. And now as to whether these are actual languages, which is not really a subject that I address at any length in my book, I don't think it has anything to my thesis. I'm open to accepting whether it's actual languages or not. It has to be actual human languages. I'm not so sure of that at all. I don't have an opinion on that whole subject. What you call the supernatural gifts, they're not separated out in any way in the New Testament from the other ones. I call them the spooky gifts that make Baptists and other people uncomfortable. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) That's what they really are. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, when you actually personally know Pentecostals and Charismatics or third wave people and I mean, if they tell you that they pray privately in tongues and they find it spiritually beneficial, I mean, when you observe their lives, it it could start to seem ridiculous just to come along and say, oh, no, it isn't. Like, (laughs) I mean, there are testimonies of people speaking in tongues and other people interpreting it, or uh, there are even some reports about people hearing a real language, their own native language, and Um, these seem like they ought to be taken into account when you're trying to interpret the New Testament. Yes, of course, Luke makes it very clear in Acts 2 that when the Holy Spirit came upon the 120 disciples and they spoke in tongues, that those were actual human languages Mm -hmm. and that the diaspora Jews attending the feast who came from their countries where they spoke those languages as their native tongue. They were hearing those languages being spoken by the 120 disciples. So Luke makes it very clear that that incident of speaking in tongues were actual human languages. But there is no other place in the New Testament where tongues are spoken of, uh, are written about, in which it makes it clear that the writer, which is usually the Apostle Paul, that he means actual human languages. Mm-hmm. And so I don't think that, you know, I'm, a, I'm open to accepting that Paul includes both human languages when he, speak, when he refers to tongues or uh, something that is not language or, you know, can it be angelic languages? I'm open to any view on that. I don't have an opinion. Well, let's get back to Peter's keys. How should we understand Peter's keys? Let's talk about the central thesis of your book. The book of Acts, Luke has chapter one, which I would call a prologue, as in the Gospel of John. The first chapter of the Gospel of John, verses one through 18, is a prologue. And so I think Luke does a similar thing when he writes his book of Acts. He quotes the risen Jesus, meaning between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension to heaven. He quotes Jesus twice. He says in verse five, John baptized with water, meaning John the Baptist, but you're gonna be baptized not many days from now with the Holy Spirit. Okay, then in verse eight, Peter says that Jesus said to them, you know, maybe not on the same occasion, but he said, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. So that's like dividing it all up. 
And that's exactly what the rest of the book of Acts, uh, down through at least chapter 19, does. You have this sequence of events concerning the baptism with the Holy Spirit. The first event happened in Acts 2 at Jerusalem at the feast. And so that was Jews. And so Peter preached the gospel to the Jews and they believe. And I think that it's right to assume that they received the Holy Spirit. Okay, then Philip goes to Samaria. He preaches the gospel and they believe. So now this is the second instance that Jesus had prophesied to them earlier by saying that it will happen in Samaria. And why does Jesus do that? Well, the the Bible divides humanity up into three categories, Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles. Now, who are Samaritans? Samaritans are half Jew and half Gentile. Mm -hmm. That happened when the Assyrians defeated Israel and took the 10 tribes, you know, Israel had by then been divided into two parts, Northern Israel, Southern Israel. And so the 10 tribes were Northern Israel and the two tribes in the South, the Southern Kingdom, that was the other part of Israel. And so that's the way Israel existed uh, shortly after King Solomon to the time of the Assyrian conquest in the eighth century. And so the Assyrians took the Northern Kingdom, the, the 10 tribes, and they didn't take all the Jews, all of the Northern Kingdom, they just took part of it. And they were intermarried with their own people. So, you know, we have this idea about the 10 lost tribes of Israel. But the Assyrians also intermarried with those who remain and those people came to be called Samaritans, half Jew, half Gentile. So here is Philip preaching the gospel to the Samaritans and they believe. And this is the second sequence that Jesus is prophes uh, prophesied about. Now the third one happens in Acts 10 and that those are Gentiles. So this is the first time that the gospel is preached to the Gentiles with the exception of one other person, that would be the eunuch in, in the last part of Acts 8. And I won't get into that, but the, the Ethiopian eunuch, Philip preached the gospel to him and he was saved. So he would have been a Gentile person, but he was a proselyte to Judaism. So that makes it a little different. But at any rate, uh, Cornelius, and then somebody could say, well, Cornelius was a proselyte also. Uh, yes, he was a little different than the Ethiopian eunuch. He had a respect for a Jewish belief. But at any rate, he was a Gentile, and he gathered together his household and friends, and Peter came, preached the gospel. And so this is the third fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy to the Jews, to the Samaritans, to the Gentiles. And so this has now been fulfilled. Peter is the one who initially preached the gospel to the Jews, and he initially preached the gospel to the Gentiles. And when it happened, some or all of them believed, and they received the Holy Spirit simultaneously. But that is not the way it happened at Samaria. And why didn't it happen that way at Samaria? Well, my thesis of my book is that it didn't happen that way at Samaria, and therefore there was this separation and subsequence between the Samaritans' conversion and their receiving of the Holy Spirit, which is the same as being baptized with the Holy Spirit. There is this subsequence of time, a few days, because Peter was not the person who preached the gospel to them when they were converted. And so that's the thesis of my book. Peter was not the one who preached the gospel. And what Jesus meant by giving Peter the keys of the kingdom was that he was going to preach the gospel and the Holy Spirit would come upon them. 
or at least the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them. And so it was when Peter and John came over there and their presence and laying hands on the, the Samaritans, they received the Spirit. And so that's the thesis of my book. The reason for this difference in the experience of the Jews at Jerusalem, the Samaritans in Acts 8, and then the Gentiles at Caesarea in Acts 10 was that it had to do with the presence of Peter. And so Peter becomes the conduit through which the power of God comes upon people who believe in Jesus. And that's what the baptism with the Holy Spirit is all about. It is the power of God coming upon God and Christ's people. And so his use of the keys to open the doors, it's opening up this blessing of the Holy Spirit to these different groups progressively. Yes, that's correct. There's one little complication for the thesis, and that's the case of the Ephesians in Acts chapter 19. And you address a whole chapter, chapter 9 in your book, to explaining what's going on there. Uh, Why is that a little bit of a problem for the thesis? And what basically do you think the answer is? At the end of Acts 18, Paul tells about Apollos, a Jew, very learned in Scripture, who knew only the baptism of John. He didn't know Christian baptism. There is a difference in the meaning between the baptism of John and Christian baptism, which began to occur after the Christ event. And Priscilla and Aquila taught Apollos more fully, which must have included about Christian baptism. So it was clear that Apollos had believed in Jesus as his savior before he met Quilla and Priscilla. And so this was not a matter of his being saved. This was only a matter of his being more fully taught about Christian baptism and who knows about spirit baptism. But uh, Luke doesn't say anything about that. But now there seems to be a connection because that happened at Ephesus. And so then Apollos left Ephesus and went somewhere to minister. In the meantime, Paul came to Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is a long ways away from Israel and Jerusalem. Paul finds these disciples. He doesn't say whether or not they're Jews or Gentiles, but it seems to be that they're Jews. And so he finds them and it appears that Luke is saying that they're already believers but Paul suspects something about them. And so he asks them a question. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Well, I don't think Luke means by their statement that they had never heard of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in their scriptures, the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament. You know, it's called by different names, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And so that isn't what Luke means in quoting them. He means that they have not heard about the coming of the Holy Spirit in this empowering manner that is referred to concerning the subject of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And so Paul now realizes that they have not been baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so he, Paul says to them, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people, believe in the one who was to come after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they, meaning the Ephesian, approximately 12 Ephesian men who believed, already believed, were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid hands on them, 
the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Now, I call this in my book an anomaly. It is an odd situation. These people, I think, were already believers in Jesus, but they had not heard about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And so because of this, they did not have the Holy Spirit. Uh, like Apollos, they, they knew John's baptism, but they didn't know about Christian baptism. And so they received the Holy Spirit there with Paul when he laid hands on them. And I call this an anomaly. It is an exception to this so-called rule, if you want to call it that, that has already been laid down in the book of Acts in the previous spirit baptism episodes. And after that, we don't have any teaching about the baptism with the Holy Spirit being received after conversion, as happened clearly in Acts 8 and Acts 19. Paul, uh, in fact, Luke doesn't say any more about the subject of the baptism with the Holy Spirit in the rest of his book of Acts. And Paul is the teacher of spirit baptism in the rest of the New Testament. And he has ample teaching on this subject and he clearly teaches that for him, meaning from the time that he's a Christian and you know is ministering, that spirit baptism happens simultaneously with conversion, meaning when people believe in Jesus and are saved, they receive the Holy Spirit then. And Paul does not say anything about any necessity of outward evidence taking place when people are spirit baptized. He says nothing about this. He teaches on the gift of tongues, but he never teaches that when a person is baptized with the Holy Spirit, that they will speak in tongues or they must speak in tongues. No, he doesn't teach anything like that. And so people receive the, spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit simultaneously upon conversion after what Jesus has prophesied would happen with his initial use of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Once Peter had done that, that Jesus had prophesied, that the Spirit of God had come upon the Jews initially in Acts 2, upon the Samaritans initially in Acts 8, and upon the Gentiles initially in Acts 10, and then the anomaly took place in Acts 19 with this odd situation in which these Samaritan men received the Spirit after they believed. Then from that point on, there is no evidence in the New Testament that Spirit baptism occurs subsequent to salvation. No, according to Paul, clearly it happens at conversion, and there is no necessity to prove that people have the Spirit by speaking in tongues or prophesying or doing any outward activity. And Paul teaches that if you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. You have received the Holy Spirit. And Paul is very clear that he interchanges receiving the Holy Spirit with baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's no difference between those expressions so that all people who are true Christians, they have the Holy Spirit. Peter has finished the, his use of his kingdom keys, and so that project in his life is finished at Acts 10. He no longer uses those keys, so that I disagree with the Catholic Church that the keys of the kingdom are perpetual. No, they aren't. The keys that Jesus gave Peter were temporary, and Peter finished his role as the person who had the keys, opening the kingdom of God 
opening up the power of the kingdom of God that comes with the Holy Spirit. Peter finished that job in Acts 10. And so like some opponents of Pentecostalism, you're disagreeing that there has to be for every Christian the second blessing that has to be evidenced in a certain way. But at the same time, you allow that there could be various ways and times in which a person is filled with the Spirit or empowered in some special way. Is that right? Yes, that's right. I have five Pentecostal relatives, a grandmother-in-law, one of my sisters, and three first cousins, all Pentecostals. I dearly love them. And they all believe, of course, that everyone needs to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It happens after you become a Christian, and it's evidenced by speaking in tongues. And I, I don't think that's correct. Uh, but I believe that the filling of the Holy Spirit is something that should be happening to all Christians in their lives. And it's something that happens multiple times, many, many times throughout a Christian's life in which the Holy Spirit is having a control upon a person. And God is manifesting himself through that person by the power of his Spirit. And so I believe in the filling of the Holy Spirit and that it happens many times. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that happens only once, and it happens at conversion. Again, the book is called Solving the Samaritan Riddle, Peter's Kingdom Keys Explain Early Spirit Baptism. It's published by Wipfenstock, W-I-P-F, and Stock. And you can find out more about it at kermitzarly.com, or you can Google search for the Kermit Zarley blog. Zarley has E-Y at the end of it. Mr. Zarley, thanks so much for talking with us. I enjoyed it very much, Dale. Did you know that the Trinity's podcast is on Facebook? You can just search for the Facebook group, Trinity's Podcast, and click a button to join, or you can go to facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. In the next few days in that group, we're going to be having a contest to win a free copy of Mr. Zarley's book that we discussed in this episode. Check out the Facebook group to find out what that contest is and win your copy. I wanted to say thanks this week to Dustin and to Benjamin for their donations via PayPal. Much appreciated, gentlemen. Also, please keep the answers coming to Podcast 124, entitled, A Challenge to Jesus is God Apologists. I am receiving those. I've gotten some mostly by email, others in the comment section for that episode. I will incorporate at least most of those in a future episode. Just don't forget that brevity is the soul of wit. And finally, this week's thinking music has been I Have Often Told You Stories, Guitar Instrumental, by Ivan Chu. You can find a link to that track at the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.